evening and welcome and thank you for joining us tonight. And for those of you attending remotely, thank you for inviting us into your home. Welcome Dr. Crosby, Brother Ernest Miller, Sister Maureen Shaughnessy, General Superior for the Sisters of Charity at St. Elizabeth. And welcome Dr. Ann Bartlett, our Vice President for Student for Academic Affairs and Catherine Buck, Vice President for Student Life and Mission Integration. And a warm welcome to our Sisters of Charity for joining us this evening. Tonight, we are honored to have with us Brother Ernest Miller from LaSalle University in Philadelphia as he presents A Dangerous Unselfishness, Creating an Anti-Racist Community and Culture. I'm Monica Luby, Chair of the Mission Council and Faculty, and at one time, a student here. I'd like to acknowledge and thank the Mission Council members the Mission Council is composed of members from all areas of the SEU community. Administration, faculty, staff, students, and members of our Sisters of Charity sponsorship. One thing you'll notice tonight that we have, the Mission Council has opted to go paper free. Before we get started, I'd also like to thank Jane Murphy Morris for her heritage display and also Virginia, um, sorry, Virginia, Batira, I know Jenny so well, sorry, Jenny, <laughs> for the beautiful display up in the art gallery. As a committee, the Mission Council is charged with providing leadership to the campus community. We serve as counsel to the president for vision, quality, and the extent to which we as a community support our Catholic social teaching and the works of Vincent de Paul, Louise de Marillac, and the Sisters of Charity founders, Mother Elizabeth Ann Seton. Founders Day is about tradition. It's about celebrating our history as an institution. It's about the present and being here, the now, the here and now, and it's about the future and having a vision. On behalf of the Mission Council, thank you in sharing tonight's conversation, creating an anti-racist community, community and culture. As a faculty in the health professions, I'm often prompted, often prompt my students in medical nutrition with the thought that you need to understand what's between your patient or client and good health. It's only more recently that I've been challenged to more deeply realize how racism physically impacts our body, mind, and spirit, and slowly chips away at our good health, potentially leading to hypertension, heart disease, and chronic illness. But I also think we could apply this thought to all our majors, pre-profession, and graduate programs whether you're in justice studies, business, education, or more, or perhaps part of a sports team or active in student government. At this time, I'd ask that you kindly silence your cell phones and perhaps put your phone aside for a while for the next hour and give yourself a moment to relax and listen with an interior attentiveness as we begin tonight's program with a mu musical meditation, Lift Every Voice and Sing, performed by our very talented SCU students. Thank you. 
Good evening. Good evening. On behalf of the Board of Trustees of St. Elizabeth University, it is my delight to welcome you to the university's annual Founders Day Symposium with brother Ernest Miller. This evening, as in previous years, we gather to celebrate the founding of St. Elizabeth University, a remarkable institution of higher learning founded in 1899 by the Sisters of Charity of St. Elizabeth with one clear mission, a mission that we remain laser focused on 122 years later, to find and educate those with the greatest need and to do so in the Catholic liberal arts tradition. This evening, we also pause to commemorate the birth of Mother Xavier, foundress of the Sisters of Charity, of St. Elizabeth. Before taking my seat, I would like to acknowledge the following individuals and groups and ask that you please stand as I call your name or group. Members of the Board of Trustees present, I saw Sister Cecile. Other members of the board present, I can't see beyond the lights. Would you please stand to be recognized? Thank you. Members of the Mission Council, all members of the Mission Council, would you please stand to be recognized? Thank you so very much for facilitating the coordination of this event. Would all Sisters of Charity of St. Elizabeth, would you please stand or wave to be recognized? Thank you for your support. All faculty in attendance, would you please stand to be recognized? Faculty. Thank you so much. Staff of St. Elizabeth University, all staff in attendance, please stand or wave if you're already standing. Alumni of St. Elizabeth University, all alumni in attendance, please stand or wave. All of my students, would you please stand to be recognized? Thank you so much for being here. And last but certainly not least, the first lady of St. Elizabeth University, Larissa, and our oldest daughter, Julia, would you please stand to be recognized? Now the real boss of the house is in the uh, carriage there. She cannot stand and that is Elise. Again, thank you all so very, very much for being here with us. And I look forward brother Ernest Miller to a uh, wonderful, wonderful lecture this evening. Thank you for your ongoing support of St. Elizabeth University. Thank you, Dr. Crosby. And I'd like to invite Mahalka Joseph to the stage who is going to introduce our speaker for this evening.
Good evening, President Crosby, faculty, staff, students, and distinguished guests. My name is Mihalka Joseph. I am a sophomore studying biology and chemistry here at Salzburg University. I am very pleased to be introducing tonight's guest speaker because as a black student, I know firsthand how important it is for us to educate ourselves on race, identity, and culture. This past October, I attended the Vicentian family gathering, which focused on the topic of racial equity. And I'm so glad that Sales of University has decided to invite Brother Ernest to continue the conversation on creating an anti-racist community and culture. Originally from New Orleans, Brother Ernest received his MA in Libra Studies and MA in International Affairs from Georgetown University in Washington, DC. Moreover, he received an MA in Education from La Salle University in Philadelphia and a BA in Political Science from Loyola University in New Orleans. A few years later, Brother Ernest received his doctorate in Ministry from the Catholic Theological Union in Chicago, Illinois. He is a member of the Institute of Brothers of the Christian School and is currently serving as a vice president for Mission, Diversity, and Inclusion at La Salle University. He is a national non-speaker and presenter who brings a deep understanding of Catholic social teaching and social justice. We are so excited to have him here with our campus community tonight. Please help me on a comment with Brother Ernest Miller. Get my watch to watch the time. <laughs> and if I may. <laughs> Tanahazy Coates author and journalist of, and in his book, Between the World and Me, it sets the stage for our time together. But all our phrasing, race relations, racial chasm, racial justice, racial profiling, white privilege, even white supremacy, serves to obscure that racism is a visceral experience that dislodges brains, blocks airways, rips muscle, contracts organs, cracks bones, breaks teeth. You must always remember that the sociology, the history, the economics, the graphs, the charts, the regressions all land with great violence upon the body. To tell the true truth, as the late sister Thea Bowman, a Franciscan sister would say, born of other bodies we are, our bodies matter. The struggle to create an anti-racist democratic society impels us to grasp this reality. Bodies matter. Your body matters. If we cannot grasp that reality, then we should not go any further. Our bodies matter. Your body matters. So with those opening thoughts, let me pause to say that I am honored to join the St. Elizabeth University community for Founders Day, this special occasion of celebrating who you are and whose you are. You are part of a grand heritage that flows from the vision and life of Louise, Louise de Marriac, Vincent de Paul, Elizabeth Ann Seton, carried forward by the Sisters of Charity of St. Elizabeth, the vision and life of these holy figures 
is now embodied in this university that values justice and achieving the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s notion of the beloved community. I am indeed glad and privileged to join you on this occasion. I want to acknowledge university president, Dr. Gary Crosby, university administrators, Sister Maureen Shaughnessy SC and all the Sisters of Charity, students, staff, faculty, and other guests. My gratitude to Monica Luby, Jane Murphy Morris, and the University Mission Council for inviting me. My thanks to John DeMucci, Executive Director of Seton Ministries, for recommend, recommending me to the Mission Council. So I want to explore this evening the theme, a dangerous unselfishness, creating an anti-racist community and culture. This notion of a dangerous unselfishness is borrowed from Martin Luther King's final sermon on the 3rd of April, 1968. I've been to the mountaintop. Let us listen to an excerpt from his last speech in which he introduces this notion. Now let me say as I move to my conclusion that we've got to give ourselves to this struggle until the end. Nothing would be more tragic than to stop at this point in Memphis. We've got to see it through. When we have our march, you need to be there. If it means leaving work, if it means leaving school, be there. Be concerned about your brother. You may not be on strap, but either we go up together or we go down together. Let us develop a kind of dangerous unselfishness. For those of you who are not immediately aware of the context, Martin King was in Memphis in support of the sanitation workers who were on strike, largely black men. Also for the context, one must understand that towards the end of Martin Luther King's life, there was a shift from merely focusing on civil and human rights to also focusing on economic rights and thus, he was in Memphis to support the sanitation workers. So I choose this notion of a dangerous unselfishness as the thematic frame to meditate on creating an anti-racist community and culture. In the spirit of Martin King, Fannie Lou Hamer, James Baldwin, Audre Lorde, Cesar Chavez, Bayard Rustin, Winona LaDuke, Daniel Berrigan, Cornell West, and others in the radical democratic tradition. I hope I say something that unsettles you, unnerves you, and even if for a moment unhouses you, if only for the sake of the common good, or put differently in theological terms, the reign of God here and now. And so let me move to what I call for myself movement one, this current moment in our democratic culture. We are facing a pandemic within a pandemic, within a pandemic. COVID-19, a global economic crisis and systemic racism. In reaction to George Floyd's 21st century lynching, 
A wave of public outrage mobilized millions of people in anti-racist protests. We watch crowds of people of every age, skin color, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, religion, and no beliefs take to the streets to cry out against deep-seated structural racism, hungry to end this scourge on our democratic life. Their shouts and slogans became a clarion call for systemic social transformation of a scope and scale unseen in decades around the United States and indeed the world. These protests arrived at a moment when many people are hungry to end the moral pandemic of systemic interlocking injustices, racism, poverty, ecological devastation, militarism, and the, the bankrupt narrative of religious nationalism that ignores these injustices. The protests arrived at a moment when many aspire to expand the quest for human freedom, human dignity, and a public life in which all peoples can flourish. Our nation is in the depths of anguish and despair, as you know. What Martin Luther King calls the disjointed elements of reality. For King, these disjointed elements constitute humanity's turn away from the vision and social hopes of the prophetic Hebrew prophets and the gospel of Jesus, which instructs us to unleash the transformative faculty of unyielding, unpretentious, and unbounded love. It is a call to bind humanity into a single garment, an inescapable network of mutuality, to create the beloved community. King understands and embraces the ethic of love grounded in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, 43, 45. The gospel writers, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. This ethic of love, central to all the major religious and spiritual traditions, summons within our bodies a dangerous unselfishness. So let us examine in movement two, the myth of race. That's a course or two unto itself, the myth of race. We gotta understand that race is a construct. It's a, a false construct, right? It is a ideological construct that has no basis in biological fact. Earlier this afternoon, I met a few students who are students of biology. And so we must understand that the myth of race functions as an organizing principle of society, undermining our democratic capacity to create an anti-racist community and culture. So I begin with the great historian, civil rights activist, social critic, writer, W.B. Du Bois, with his assertion at the opening of the 20th century. The problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. Though written 38 years after the end of slavery in the US, this analysis remains desperately relevant today. The problem of the 21st century is the problem of the color line. Our values and ideals are neither bound by time nor bound by social location. Hence, we must reflect on our failures and our failures to demonstrate visibly our commitment to dismantle the structures of white supremacy and privilege that encode race and racism 
in the fabric of our educational institutions and the wider society. We must undertake a critical inventory of self and institutions to recollect how we perpetuate racial inequities and give witness to what the biblical vision of justice looks like, in which none is, as the Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians, no longer strangers and aliens. As Socrates says in line 38a of Plato's Apology, the unexamined life is not worth living. If we read across the life of Dorothy Day or Malcolm X, it says that the examined life is painful. And so we hold on to Plato's notion. I want to introduce get my the trauma therapist and author of My Grandmother's Hands, Resma Minicum. He uncovers for us a deeper layer of the mythical realities of race under which we live. Listen for a moment. We have ingested the idea that the white body, again, this is a construct, that the white body is the supreme standard of humanity, he writes. While we see anger and violence in the streets of our country, the real battlefield is inside all of our bodies of every color. So including this dark-hued body, I am infected by the virus of white body supremacy. I am caught in the net of white body supremacy. We all are. Mesma Rinicum Minicum continues. If we are to survive as a country, it is inside our bodies where this conflict needs to be resolved. That the vital force behind white supremacy is in our nervous system. Minicum opens our eyes to questions about white body supremacy, often left unexamined. He draws attention to the need for white bodies to deal with the uncomfortableness of confronting white body supremacy and begins somatically abolishing it. It does not matter if a person of white is a progressive or a devout racist. At the same time, at the same time, people of color must interrogate themselves. Menachem contends people of color have ingested the idea that the white body is the supreme standard of humanity. Even within our own cultures, across cultures, across communities of color, there is anti-blackness that's woven into things, he writes. In other words, white body supremacy induces people of color to damage people of color. One aspect of this damage often set aside and unresolved is colorism, a prejudicial or prefer preferential treatment among black and other people of color and white people too, that favors a lighter skinned person of color rather than a darker skinned person of color. Just as an aside, uh, in teaching a seminar at our LaSalle High School in Pittsburgh, one of the things that we would do in a certain segment of the seminar is that we and my students, mostly white, would examine music videos. And we would examine advertisements. Advertisements for stores like Abercrombie and Fitch. 
and look at magazine covers and commercials. So look at music videos and look at the women who are in front and look at the women who are in the back. Look at Abercrombie and Fitch, though perhaps in recent times, perhaps some of their advertisements and similar stores have begun to change. But Abercrombie and Fitch was the recipient of a class action lawsuit some many years ago because of the discrimination of who they allowed to work the floor, the retail floor. And it's not unique to Abercrombie and Fitch. It's in our culture. But let me go further. The childhood experiences of Kimberly J. Norwood, a professor of law at Washington University, she is a darker hued woman, while her mother was a lighter skinned woman, illumines our understanding. She says to us Our values and ideals are neither bound by time. No, pardon me. I grew up to understand that the color hierarchy was simply the way of the world. I would eventually marry and have children of my own. And through those children, I would again see colorism grow and sting. I saw in my male children a preference for white over black. My girls watched boys make choices based on skin color and hair length and texture. I listened to their friends and observed the interplay in their social interactions. I watched school plays with black children playing roles, but almost never black children with my skin color. So my sisters and brothers, if we are to reckon with the pandemic of racism, with the construct of race and white body supremacy, we cannot pretend that we do not see color. Because, as she says, it results in a divisive society. It wreaks havoc within families. It challenges friendships. It feeds stereotypes, tensions, bigotry, and hate. The purported blindness to color hurts. It harms. It kills. We cannot begin to detangle this problem, or to use another word that you might encounter in courses, deconstruct this problem if we won't recognize it, she says. This notion, sisters and brothers, of color blindness is a false notion, right? It itself is a false construct, color blindness. Run from it, escape from it, or as students of the academy, Critique it. And so with that context, let me move to movement three. How then do we move from confusion to moral and spiritual renewal to fix our individual and the collective human condition? In these troubled times, we must not only bear witness to a different way of being in the world, but also reveal the willful ignorance about how our own choices make racism possible and keep racism, a social sin, alive. We must continue to discern how to define and shape what the future should be, anti-racist, a community of persons all with equal dignity, committed to each other's flourishing, bound together to achieve Ubuntu, the Southern African expression that means I am because you are. Our values and our ideals are neither bound by time nor bound by social location. The decoding, the breaking down, the dismantling of white body supremacy in the fabric of our educational institutions and society must begin now. 
We must undertake a critical inventory of self and institutions to recollect how we perpetuate racial inequities. Again, Plato's Socrates, line 38a. It ran as a thread through the seminar that I taught at Central Catholic Pittsburgh. The unexamined life is not worth living. And what Plato Socrates means by that is we not only must examine self, our individuality, but also community, right? Both, because we don't live in a vacuum. We in our individuality as opposed to naked, rigid individualism is within community, right? And thus our theme this evening, that we are on a journey, a struggle, and I use the word struggle in a holy sense, to create an anti-racist community and culture, right? And so I conclude with these three points. First, we must be uncomfortable. The Reverend Brian Massengale, a professor of applied Christian ethics at Fordham, a dear friend, points out that white people find the term white supremacy an even greater stumbling block than white privilege. Massengale asserts, understand the difference between being uncomfortable and being threatened. There is no way to tell the truth about race in this country without white people becoming uncomfortable. Because the plain truth is that if it were up to people of color, racism would have been resolved over and done a long time ago. The only reason for racism's persistence is that white people continue to benefit from it. So we got to be uncomfortable. But I also extend that people of color need to be uncomfortable as well. Because as Resma Minicum points out, we are also infected by the virus of white body supremacy. Second, witness courage. Discover in yourself that you can act to create an anti-racist community and culture as a result of developing an unselfishness, a dangerous unselfishness. Courage requires knowledge that transforms who you are. Princeton professor of religion and African-American studies, Eddie Glaude maintains, we have to find the courage to confront honestly the lies that rest in us if we are to dismantle structural racism. To create a different world, says Massengale, we must learn. Notice the word learn. We must learn. We must acquire knowledge. That is why we are here in the university to learn, to acquire knowledge, to acquire knowledge, to learn. Amen? 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 We must learn how this world came to be, Massengale says. And we must unlearn what we previously took for granted. To undo the skillful miseducation about black, brown, indigenous, and other peoples of color, BIPOC, we ought to embrace what the ancient Greeks called paideia, that beautiful ancient Greek word, paideia, P-A-I-D-E-I-A. It, it, it refers to a deep education, a critical education, as opposed to mere schooling. If we are to amplify our participation in justice creation, there is warrant for a St. Elizabeth University education steeped in the charism and heritage of the Sisters of Charity. To participate in justice creation and to adopt a critical pedagogy, a discourse of educated hope and possibility across the curriculum and co-curriculum 
of St. Elizabeth University. And third, remain committed for the long haul. Remain committed for the long haul. Right, there's already concern that after the months of protests following the lynching of George Floyd and, and the killing of Breonna Taylor and others, Ahmaud um, Arbery and countless others, that it's over, but it's not over as we know. So we got to remain committed for the long haul. The struggle for justice and the struggle for peace, the struggle to attain a dangerous unselfishness is a long distance run. But I appeal to you, my sisters and brothers, that you also must find a way to rest because this battle of ours isn't going to end soon. So are you willing to commit yourself for the long haul? Answering this question requires prayer, discernment, and dialogue. I hope you will say yes. We have a summons to become prisoners of prophetic hope, declares the prophet Zechariah. Consequently, our exacting task is to keep track of not only our wounds and suffering, but also our strengths and our tremendous possibilities for coming together to take decisive steps as communities of struggle and hope. LaSalle, Philadelphia, St. Elizabeth Convent Station. Communities of struggle and hope toward widening and strengthening human democracy. So if we are to rid the world of the problem of race and the odors and fumes that flow from the construct of race, indeed anti-Blackness, it is by first ridding our bodies, your body, my body, of this contagious evil. So I appeal to you, by grace and mercy, to acquire a dangerous unselfishness in order to create an anti-racist community and culture. Let us give glory and honor to Almighty God. Thank you, my sisters and brothers. Thank you for those profound words. And you really painted a vision for all of us to work towards. Thank you very much. We're gonna open this up to questions. So um, Jane, if you'd like to come up and Samantha and Josh. And please don't be inhibited. There's not a wrong question, and there's also not a complete answer. Don't worry, brother. I'm very nudgy. We'll get questions. <laughs> <laughs> you in the front. No. <laughs> Does anybody have a pressing question? I know. Hang on one sec. Yeah. Hold on one sec. Before Michael goes, because we know he'll have a profound. Okay. <laughs> You're next. Good evening. Um, my name is Love T. I'm a senior. I'm, my major is criminal justice. Um, my question is mostly because um, I'm a single mom. I have a son. He's four years old. So my question to you is, how can I, since he's four, how can I tell him about racism as he grow up? Because it's difficult for me now to like, oh, in reality, because of the color of your skin, you're going to be judged. And then um, also, like schooling, because I think about the future, how, like, how do I go about like taking him to the right school or thinking about the right neighborhood? Because no matter where you go, there's a bad neighborhood and a good neighborhood. And then there's bad schools and good schools. Like, I don't, that's like, I'm still juggling. I don't really know because it's just me as a mother. So it's just like, 
it's hard to really explain to him his reality as he gets older. I appreciate your question and I stand in solidarity with you. As an educator, as someone who loves the classroom, the space, the institution or institutions that you're going to choose soon for your son is crucial. And so I beg you to struggle, to find as best as you are able the school and the schools that are going to afford your son a paideia education, not mere schooling. You want to find the school that is going to itself be in the vanguard of creating community and culture, right? That the school is itself a microcosm of the beloved community that Martin King and others so envision. They do exist. Ever incomplete, ever imperfect, right? So education is crucial. And so I pray that you struggle to the farthest possibilities to find that right fit for your son. That's gonna be crucial. But second, it is, your love, it is family, it is the, the community in which you live, and the larger culture that is also going to play a significant role in, right? Because the notion, again, that we do not live in a vacuum as individuals, in our individuality, we live within community, right? And we live in different types of communities. The school is community, the neighborhood is a community, your family is a community, the school, and so on and so forth, right? So those two things, community, communities, where you plant your son, where he plants his feet as a young man is gonna be crucial, and education. Can I leave you with those two foundation stones? But first and foremost, of course, your love. Thank you. I don't have a question. I just want to thank Brother Ernest for sharing his thoughts with us tonight and to challenge us as a <laughs> campus community to, to really do the introspective work that it takes um, to create the kingdom here. Um, so thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us tonight. I appreciate that. Um, hi, I'm Jasmine. I'm a sophomore. Um, my question is on critical race theory. How do you think that we should teach it inside of schools and how do you think that we should bring it inside of our curriculum inside of college so we can understand all of the new history that is being taught because we didn't get a chance to learn that? I appreciate that. So, of course, I was in the library earlier um, in the Campus Ministry Center meeting with about 14 or 15 of your fellow students. And as I was walking out of the library, right, I hope many of you recognize that there is a display going on, um, right? And there, within one of the display cases, um, probably more than one display cases, there are books, right? We know what books are, right? Um, and there are books that we cannot find on just searching Google, right? Um, and what is one of the books? Critical race theory, right? I wanna suggest, my dear sister, that we need to begin by, as I would tell my students, and they know it at homonym, in order to grasp critical race theory, we got to do these things. And in order to grasp biology, in order to grasp, we have to read, we have to think, we have to speak, and we have to write. 
And in doing those things, then to answer your question, we, begin, we can begin to engage in counter critical race theory. This hullabaloo that surrounds critical race theory, again, is noise, right? It's a distraction. Critical race theory, we would hope, finds its way in a variety of courses, right? And so it is not something to run away from, and indeed we can't run away from, because when we really talk about critical race theory, we're talking about James Baldwin, we're talking about Fannie Lou Hamer, we're talking about Martin King, we're talking about Ella Baker, right? We're talking about Bayard Rustin, we're talking about um, W.B. Du Bois, we're talking about all the, the men and women who have gone before us. We're talking about Frederick Douglass, we're talking about Sojourner Truth. That, that, that's critical race theory. Critical race theory is that lived history, that critical race theory is those realities that is part of the American story, right? But we have allowed certain voices to find space, right? And it creates this noise and we get all discombobulated that critical race theory is some sort of foreign notion that has floated from the farthest universe, right? No, it's our lived realities of which we're trying to wrestle. So I, my hope is that we, in courses, right? That we find opportunities to critically engage, right? That it cannot, we can't deal with it by mere schooling, right? And so that is why it was so important for me on the secondary level, that for my students before they got to the college space, that by the time they got to the college space, this is not foreign territory, right? But if it is foreign territory, when you arrive here at Southern Elizabeth, my hope is that you're going to find courses that engages, wrestles with this deep history, but that also, my dear sister, my hope is that you and other students have agency, right? That even if you find it in the classroom, and certainly if you don't find it in the classroom, that you have agency to engage in self-education, right? And so you can go to the library right now and just open up the bookcase and have at it because there are a variety of books, right? My, my, my young sisters and brothers, my youngest sisters and brothers in the room, my dear students, and, and I am a student, I will always be a student. I cannot emphasize enough that we need to be in touch with texts, right? I, I have former students who are still shouting certain words perhaps because from day one, we are in touch with texts. So I implore you, my younger sisters and brothers, my dear students, that we gotta be in touch with text. We gotta be in touch with history. We gotta be in touch with our story, irrespective of what your discipline is, right? Irrespective of what your discipline is. So I hope that answers your question in some way. But if there's anything, have self-agency. Hi, I'm Sister Elena. Um, can you talk about the need for rest? It's hard when, when there's so much work. I was elated again when I met with uh, some of the students this afternoon to hear that um, Ms. Joseph, um, and again, thank you, Ms. Joseph, for your kind introduction that among other accolades, uh, she is going to help lead a retreat uh, the first weekend of April. If you're not aware of that retreat, here's a public announcement. Um, because it is a sign that we must find rest. And for me, if I could continuously ride a train, long distance, I'm a, a train lover. 
So for me, one of the great places to find rest and solitude is a long distance train ride from here to Seattle. Not from here, Convent Station or New Jersey Transit to New York Penn Station. Oh my goodness. I, I, and do allow me to say, and I'm gonna get more to the heart of your question, but this is, I, I am a bit envious that you sisters of charity were able to get a train station named Convent Station. I'm envious of that. Hebrews, yeah, they built it. Let's go to the letter to the Hebrews. Chapter four, verse three where the writer says, there must be rest, find rest. Why do we need to be in rest? Because this work of creating an anti-racist community and culture is for the long haul. So if along this long distance run, we're not finding rest. And what do we need to be doing in rest? We need to be in rest to engage in discernment, in contemplation, and in prayer. Because those become sources of sustenance to then be able to engage in action, right? In some ways, it's, it's circular, right? That we're continuing in the movement of rest. And so I think of John Baptist de La Salle, St. LaSalle, who's the founder of the Religious Institute to which I belong, the Brothers of the Christian Schools. And when I look at his movement, it is prayer, contemplation, action. Prayer, contemplation, action, right? There's nothing wholly unique about it. So how do we find that sort of encounter for ourselves individually and at times like retreat as a community? Because we find rest, not just alone, but sometimes alone. I'm an only child and so I love solitude. I'm comfortable with solitude. I'm comfortable with being alone. But I'm also comfortable and look for opportunities as they are appropriate and are available to find rest, to find retreat as a community, because we find strength both ways, right? And so there's a beautiful gospel uh, song out of the uh, Black musical gospel tradition. Um, that is built on Hebrews 4.3. It's a beautiful song. And so I commend to you, if you're interested, uh, to find it and listen to it. It's a powerful song. And, and I think through song and listening to that song, perhaps sister among others, that short verse of Hebrews 4.3 comes alive find rest. I, I'm listening to the song in my head. I'm not going to sing it. I'm not a trained voice. But find rest. Come to thy rest. And that is where we find renewal and nourishment, recovery for this long haul. I think we might have time for one more. And he's been waiting. This is my new friend. I've been, I've been more patient historian. than usual. <laughs> Please, my brother. Ms. Murphy Morris knows I've been more patient than usual today. Um, Patience is a virtue. Not normally one I possess. Uh, first, a comment. Uh, I, uh, your, speak, uh, your speaking today reminds me of the writing a, uh, a uh, comment written by science fiction author and game designer, Mike Pondsmith, where he reflects on race saying the, saying the cause of the cause of trouble, the cause of trouble in the world is people caring more about themselves than anybody else. I probably butchered his quote, but it, it's in like the foreword of one of his books. 
And uh, second, for, for some reason I've yet to completely understand, people tend to look to me for advice. Maybe it's because, maybe it's because most of my friends are younger than me because I stole them from my siblings. Uh, maybe, it's because, maybe it's because I was the big guy in the special ed department back in high school and all the other guys in the special ed department would come to me for help. But I last, uh, last uh, two years ago, actually, uh, during, uh, shortly after the George Floyd murder, uh, a dear friend of mine just came to me and poured their heart out and talked to me about this. Mm -hmm. How do I, as a white person who has never experienced, who's, who's never directly experienced this kind of discrimination, help with this? I've tried to relate my experiences as a person with a disability, but I know that's not the same. And I try, I'm trying my best to help my people, help my crew, but it's, I don't have the necessary experience to do this. I just try to, how, how do you suggest I do this? I'm trying my best, but I want someone else's opinion. Amen, amen. I empathize with uh, your testimony. One, to realize you are already doing what you can do and that is to be friend. There is a deep spiritual dimension to friendship. And so that's point one, be friend. A second point that I will make is that to go to sister's question about rest, you express that you are struggling in your own individuality to be friend, to be better friend, but it also requires, it, it also demands in a certain way that you also find help, that you find support, that you find guidance from others, right? This, this can't be your struggle alone, alone, alone. And so find your space with others for rest and retreat, right? Because you are going to find support and guidance in your encounter with others, in dialogue with others, right? As Resma Minicum says, right? And this third point is going to ultimately invite you to invite the spirit to lead you to continue to look within, right? There is sort of an escape to say, but not me, right? But as I read Resma Minicum, and I do recommend to all of you his book, My Grandmother's Hands. And, and I won't tell you why he entitles it that, but that beautiful title and the subtitle is about racial trauma, right? It is to recognize that all of us in some way or another are caught in the net of racial trauma because it's within our nervous systems, as he says. And so ultimately, in one sense, we have to recognize that even when we don't immediately see it, it's there, it's within us, right? And it takes time, right? As we can see, we're now moving into a third year of this pandemic, it takes time. And so for each of us individually, my brother, and for us as a community, it takes time to allow the virus to come out of us, right? So my last observation to you and to all of us is to be comfortable with being uncomfortable, right? I am sensing you in your public testimony that you are made uncomfortable. It's okay, right? Really more of not knowing what the answer is, it is a form of uncomfort. And so to that, I say it is okay to lean, as you might recall, we were talking about earlier this afternoon in the Campus Ministry Center, it is, and it is okay 
to lean into uncertainty, right? All the answers are not going to come to us immediately. All the healing, all the, the recovery of self is not going to be immediately. So we got to be comfortable. And again, that goes to rest, right? It is in rest that we come to realize that uncertainty is okay. And there I would recommend, and I think some in this room might be familiar with the film, Doubt. The film Doubt. At the end of the film, one comes to realize that there is grace and mercy in being uncomfortable and that there is grace and mercy in being situated in doubt. So rest. I can see, I can sense that you are wrestling with because the answer is not totally there. It's okay. Rest. Rest. Let us all rest because this is a long distance run. Thank you. Thank you very much. We would like to, in, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you very much for your thoughtful participation. Brother Miller, thank you for your insightful discussions. At this time, on behalf of the Mission Council, I would like to welcome Sister Maureen Shaughnessy to the podium to deliver our concluding remarks. Good evening. In the conclusion of her book, Three Score and Ten, Sister Blanche Marie McInerney, a revered history professor and archivist of the College of St. Elizabeth wrote this, and I quote, but it is the words of the poet Carl Sandburg that most aptly tell her story, meaning the college. We have come far, and we are going farther yet." End of quote. Sister Blanche's book covered a history of the college from the years 1899 to 1969, a 70 year span. 53 years later, we can echo those words, realizing the tremendous strides that have been made, the quantum leaps that have been taken, and yet knowing that we have farther to go yet. Tonight, we honor the founder of this wonderful ministry of the Sisters of Charity of St. Elizabeth, Mother Mary Xavier Meehan, who had the courage to allow her sisters, who were eager to inaugurate the first college for women in New Jersey. The Sisters of Charity of St. Elizabeth throughout our history have striven to meet the needs of those who are poor, underserved, and on the margins through ministries in education, healthcare, social and pastoral services. Brother Ernest's topic tonight is one that our sisters and associates have been discussing and praying about in an intentional way for the last 18 months. The scourge of racism is at the root of our problems in our society and one that many would either excuse or deny. We will not heal as a society until we face it honestly and admit our complicity in condoning policies and practices that perpetuate it, both explicitly and implicitly. As a congregation, we have been developing a public stand statement on racism that we expect to issue within the next few months. We thank the university, Dr. Gary Crosby, the members of the Mission Council for intentionally honoring Mother Xavier and the sisters who worked with her in the Ministry of Education with an emphasis on the leadership development of women. Today, in its evolution, the university is proudly educating both men and women 
focusing on educating them for service for others. This perspective is grounded in the Vincentian Setonian tradition of the Sisters of Charity. It will serve the, years, the university for years to come as a firm foundation. Thank you all for being here this evening. And thank you, brother. Thank you very much, Sister Maureen. Samantha, come on out and join me. Thank you all for joining us tonight. And Jane and Josh, all set for our final song here and our closing. Thank you all for joining us tonight. This was a very, um, I've been a member of the community and education here for over 32 years. And this was very important for us to have this conversation tonight. And I think, God willing, we'll all go home and think about this. And it may take days, months, years, we can do this. This is who St. Elizabeth, our university is all about, is creating that new future and vision. So I pray for all of you and thank you for joining us tonight. So our final announcement is that there are snacks outside. I'm going to ask, yes, exciting. Um, I'm going to ask that our students don't run over faculty, staff, and sisters on the way out. We're just going to sing one um, verse of this, this little light of mine, sort of on the way. You can either, you know, like gently walk out because I'm sure that, you know, maybe some of you have to go to bed because it's, you know, it's a little bit late for some of us. Um, but if we just kind of end the, the night in, um, in some joyous song, um, if you can clap to the music, that's great. If you can't, that's okay too. So. Um, go ahead and hit it, Ron. This light of mine, this little light of mine, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it Shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it, let it shine, shine, let it shine. is the